Well, uh, th um, th thank you very much for inviting me to um, talk. And it's always nice to talk to the Historic Society. And I should say, as president of the Antiquarians, it's also nice to talk to our, our older sister in terms of regional uh, societies. So uh, uh, both societies, I should point out, have been at the forefront of um, history and archaeology and heritage research for over a century. So uh, it's it's a great tradition um, um, for both societies, and um, I hope the historic society will uh, will continue to um, do this kind of thing for for many years to come. Although I am very well aware that in the post COVID environment, things are quite can be quite tricky for for our local and regional um, history and archaeology societies. Um, just uh, just before I, I, I start, just a, a word about <laughs> what I currently do. So. Uh, many of you will know me because I've been uh, around in the Northwest for many, many years. Um, I was a um, senior lecturer at University of Manchester and uh, University of Salford and head of a department there for the archaeology section uh, for about 11 years and then decided to move jobs three weeks before the pandemic hit. <laughs> so I'm uh, with great timing. So uh, I moved into a national role of uh, an England-wide role as Industrial Heritage Support Officer for England, based at the Ironbridge Gorge Museum Trust, funded by Historic England, with responsibility to, to research and, and oversee and, uh, and support the 400 organisations in England that, that deal with protected industrial heritage sites um, that are open to the public, which is fine as long as they are open, but obviously for two years, many of those sites won't. However, uh, my job involves talking a lot online like this and meeting people online, um, which is why I'm still based in the northwest of England, which is why I'm currently president of the Lancashire and Cheshire Antiquarian Society and still hold a, an honorary research uh, fellowship position at the University of Salford. And what I'm talking about this, this afternoon is the one of these long range research projects engagement projects that finally came to fruition uh, at the end of last year and the beginning of this year uh, delayed by covid and i'll talk a bit about that so so i'm going to spend the next 45 50 minutes talking about researching the northwest uh, archaeology and built environment so i'm now going to share my screen uh, the key thing here is to choose the right screen to share and um, if you could give me a thumbs up, if that's just the one screen, oh, brilliant. Brilliant. So there you are. Um, framing the past, updating the Northwest Regional Research Framework 2016 to 2023. I should say immediately that what I'm talking about here is a collaborative research project. Um, as you can see, spread spread over seven years. It was envisaged as being over four years, but but it turned out to be seven for COVID reasons. Collaborative project between um, built environment professionals, archaeologists, planning and um, planning archaeologists, conservation uh, archaeology uh, architects, and um, local authority based people, museum based people, uh, professional people from. Uh, architecture from archaeology, massive support from Historic England who funded the project, and also support from the Council for British Archaeology Northwest, who uh, enabled the uh, a lot of the engagement and indeed enabled the uh, the publication both in terms of the PDF and um, uh, and, and printed volume, and, and the project was actually delivered by a research team. Um, with representatives from local authorities, from Historic England. I see Sue Stalybrass is, is here this afternoon. Sue, Sue was a key part of that as um, a science advisor through Historic England for the Northwest, uh, massively supportive. And also Dan Miles at uh, Historic England level who oversaw the project. It's important to say all of that because there's no way one person could deliver what I'm about to talk about. It's very much the communal response and the communal thoughts of those working 
in archaeology and the built environment, looking at what we what we as a as that broadest community group possible think is important and how we should go about re researching and promoting um, that work. And this project is does not stand on its own. Firstly, there was a uh, it's an update of an original research framework funded at the time by English Heritage and uh, managed through Cumbria County Council's archaeology sex section, uh, Mark Brennan, Mark Brennan, who, who understandably didn't want to do it, so didn't want to manage it second time around. Uh, and, and I understand that why now, having spent seven years bringing this to fruition. Um, and that was very much focused on below ground archaeological remains. This new update um, expanded the remit to include specifically standing buildings from the late medieval period through to the 20th, 20th century and landscapes, which is why it has morphed into uh, the historic environment um, research framework. And this is one of a series of initiatives that Historic England have been promoting since the 1990s. Um, and now with the uh, heritage agencies in uh, Wales and Scotland, there is uh, a central website, which I will show you at the end of, um, end of my talk, where you can go and click on a map of the UK and it will bring up the digitized versions of dozens and dozens of research frameworks. Uh, there are three up here that just show you the scope of the research framework um, approach. Um, it includes regional research frameworks, city research frameworks. It includes period research frameworks. I could have chosen the Mesolithic. I, I chose mining and quarrying there. And it includes research frameworks for pieces of landscape such as uh, world heritage sites and there's the Durban Valley and Derbyshire there to demonstrate that. There's, there is some debate, among, particularly amongst academics, about the value of research frameworks, but I think it's very important to point out, particularly in archaeology and increasingly in uh, the built heritage world, looking at above ground structures, buildings archaeology you might say, that with the recording for recording's sake is not enough is not a good enough excuse to do a lot of this work particularly within the professional world there has to be clear reasons to spend that resource that time and effort and i think we're all aware about how tight budgets are in the um, post covid post invasion of ukraine world and so having a research framework is really a way of organizing thoughts and ideas around what we as the groups working on these particular areas think might be important and how those uh, those questions might be taken forward clearly what we think is important today might be different to what we think is important in 10 years time so these frameworks evolve and change i think it's very important to have them they're not there as a straitjacket, they're there to guide and aid. But inevitably, they do provide um, a foundation for funders to make decisions about whether they should fund particular projects. That could be the National Heritage Lottery Fund, it could be Historic England, it could be um, other big national charities, might be the Arts Council, for instance, who do, who do a, fund a lot of heritage work, or it could be uh, smaller um, smaller regional-based charities who have funds, or, or, or indeed local authorities and museums who want to uh, think about where they might take their research next. So I think it's far better, and I wouldn't have done this work, and my team, the team I'm working with wouldn't have done this work, it's far better to have a framework um, in the first place and to have that framework developed by the, by the uh, individuals and the organisations who then might make use of it. The background to both the first Northwest Archaeology Framework and the new one that we've just launched 
is the evolving planning framework for the historic environment, archaeology and buildings from the 1990s. Well, it says there to 2018, but in, in fact, we're about to have a, an update of the National Planning Policy Framework, which is just um, revisions of which are, are due to be published any day now by the UK government. And you can see here increasingly that this reflects the professionalisation of archaeology, the professionalisation um, of uh, building studies. Uh, and uh, it's not just in England. Um, I've thrown up there some legislation from Scotland as well, where the uh, legal system is slightly uh, different. Uh, and at the moment, uh, England and Wales are, are sort of still linked in for some planning policy um, details, but uh, yeah, inevitably with devolution, Wales will be developing its own uh, increasingly developing its own uh, heritage strategy, particularly within planning, and therefore you know, they will have their own research uh, frameworks. Way back in 2006 and 2007, um, the very first research framework for Northwest England, the archaeology thereof, was, was produced. That was the product of a three-year project as I said, it was it, it was led by the Association of Local Government Archaeologists in the region with Mark Brennan, who was who is the county archaeologist, the lead planning archaeologist for Cumbria, uh, organising project and bringing in a team uh, based around those local government archaeologists, but including uh, the wider profession, the wider uh, community and voluntary uh, societies and groups in the region. The output of that, and bearing in mind this was a project that was done between 2004 and 2007, was very much a paper-based um, set of uh, overviews of the archaeology by period of Northwest England. And I should say that Northwest England in this context includes not just the old counties of Lancashire and Cheshire, which the Historic Society, of course, covers, but also the newer counties of Merseyside, Greater Manchester and Cumbria. Although I do notice that Cumbria is about to disappear as a, as, as a modern county to be replaced by Cumberland and a form of Westmoreland, which is all desperately confusing. But uh, essentially, it's that northwestern corner of England. And of course, that's a region which has links with other home countries. We, we have two borders. Uh, two national borders in the northwest. We have the uh, border with Wales in the northern part of the march, which is on the Cheshire border. And of course, we have the border with Scotland at the northern end of the region along the northern edge of Cumbria. So we ended up producing two volumes in 2006-2007 on the back of um, a couple of conferences and some uh, workshops, invited workshops, uh, the first volume was a summary of our current state of archaeological knowledge from deepest prehistory through to the 20th century. And the second volume was a volume that uh, laid out the research questions that we as at the time thought were important. That was very much a product of the mid 2000s. And as I said, it was it was almost a pre digital product. Um, Fast forward to a decade, to the mid 2010s, and it was felt that there was a growing need to update that research framework. In fairness, Historic England um, had been saying since the 1990s that once these frameworks were put in place, whether it be for a piece of landscape, a, a city, or a period, then they would be need to be uh, refreshed and revisited on a regular basis. And the research framework for the East of England, for instance, well, East, East Anglia, uh, has gone through three versions since that was first uh, written in the 1990s. So the Northwest of England, in some ways, was late, late to this strategy. But uh, by the time we get to the mid 2010s, it was very clear that the volume of redevelopment, in particular, in Northwest England. And coupled with that, the growth of the university sector and the growth in undergraduate and postgraduate students in researching um, 
the historic environment was such that there was a vast amount of new material throwing new light on all periods that needed to be included within that original research framework. And in particular, the decision was taken by Historic England that this should include the built environment explicitly, uh, which is what we did when we proposed updating the framework for Northwest England, which is why it's called the Historic Environment Framework. In fact, this is one of the first research frameworks in England to be revised, archaeology research frameworks in England, to be revised in this way. Um, you can see some rough estimates there from 20, um, 2017, 2018 of <clears throat> our initial thoughts as to the volume of work that had gone on. We, we, we knew at the time that there had been at least 400 published articles and monument monographs between 07 and, seven, and 2017, and at least 1,500 developer-funded reports. <laughs> as it turns out, that proved to be a, a massive under um, un, um, sort of underestimate, um, and I'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, and also, the range of people undertaking this work uh, had increased as well, not, not just there being more uh, university students, but but more ad hoc community groups as well, working in the archaeology and uh, history field as well. The aim of the update was therefore to make this new framework as accessible as possible and to make it as up to date as possible. And it was commissioned at a time when a series of other um, research frameworks were also being updated, East of England and the Northeast frameworks in particular. And the intention was to put these all online in an interactive wiki website that wouldn't just be static, but which could be evolved and updated um, by the local uh, by by the local individuals interested in, in, in this kind of research over the next few years. So it wouldn't just sit there as a static document which is really what happened to the original archaeological framework. Nothing, not, not a criticism, that's just an observation. Uh, the technology wasn't really um, feasible, wasn't, wasn't, really, um, wasn't really efficient to make it fully interactive back in the mid-2000s, but it was a decade later, and, and, and this project has definitely taken advantage of that move to the online environment. I mean, we want to know that COVID would hit, a mass pandemic would hit in March 2020 and would force everybody not only to stay at home for, for months on end, but also force a lot of home working and a lot of internet working. So that now the other side of COVID, I think it, it's in, entirely logical to make a framework like this available online, make it interactive online, make it updatable online, because it gets to more people. There were three phases to this project. Now, we weren't working for a blank, blank canvas. We already had the initial um, resource assessment, as, as, as the jargon uh, puts it, the initial overview of what we had in terms of archaeology from 2006. Of course, we didn't have an assessment of the above ground built heritage of the buildings. So that was one thing we had to a commission and research and write from scratch. And I have to say, Marion Barton was responsible for that. And she took on a, a really large job and did an excellent, um, uh, an excellent research uh, project in pulling that all together. And I have nothing but admiration for, for how she coped with the thousands of buildings uh, that she had to uh, summarise and characterise for, for that particular section of the project. Another thing that had changed since 2006-07 was local government cuts meant that Algeo, our, our, our Algeo colleagues in the northwest, did no longer have the capacity to manage the project, although they were more than happy to contribute to it. Uh, and that was fortunate because in doing this project, we were able to, to, to include individuals who were close to retirement, close to moving out of uh, uh, the built, uh, the historic environment professions and taking with them that knowledge. So we were able to update this with many of the participants who took 
part in the mid 2000s. The project was led by the University of Salford in cooperation and conjunction with the Council for British Archaeology North West. And the North, uh, the CBA North West were vital to this process because they provided the link to much of the community involvement in the Northwest region. And we also included CBA North who, who, who cover uh, voluntary archaeology matters in the Cumbrian area. So, so we had the two sides of, of the, the research interests, the, the voluntary and the professional. As I said, the scope of this work, the kind of data we were looking at, um, was also much larger than in 06, 07. So we were looking at below ground, um, below ground archaeology, classic archaeology, of which there had been a huge amount since the last framework, but also above ground buildings and landscapes, a new, new territory in terms of summarising. I mean, there's a huge amount of material to go on, uh, in terms of buildings, heritage, um, buildings, archaeology and history in the Northwest. You just have to look at the um, Pevsner guides to the buildings of a particular county to see how rich the uh, built environment is in the Northwest. But we were trying to concentrate that into a coherent overview and come out with some research questions, which is actually slightly harder to do. Um, and then, of course, there's the published work and the unpublished material, what we call the grey literature. And as I said, we had a rough estimate when we put the project design to Historic England in 2016, 2017. You know, we, we, we knew at least 400 published articles. We knew at least 1,500 grey literature material, which is primarily, but not exclusively, done through the planning process. But actually, there are hundreds of items done by local societies and groups that are never formally published, but are there available for research. As I said, that was an underestimate. And then the consultees. We wanted this to be as broad based a project as the first one was. The first one involved all these groups you see here, the archaeology, history and heritage societies and groups in the region, the professional archaeology and built heritage sectors, the universities, local authorities, museums, world heritage sites. I mean, the Northwest had acquired and lost a world heritage site, uh, respectively, uh, in between the two research frameworks. Um, and then the national agencies and the national and region, regional charities and anybody else with an interest who wanted to contribute. First time around, we had over 200 people contributing actively to the research and writing um, of those chapters and of the research questions. So we wanted to do at least the same. That's an important point because by expanding the project to include the built environment buildings, it also pulled us into the world of local history, which of course the Historic Society of Lancashire and Cheshire is well aware of and has promoted for many decades. Um, that meant in not just liaising with the dozens of archaeology societies and groups in northwest England. And on the left, you see a map from 2010 published by the CBA showing you where there are roughly a thousand archaeology societies in, 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 in Britain and Northern Ireland at the time. It's about a similar number today. But also that meant talking to or giving the opportunity to have the involvement of local history societies and regional history societies. And that was on the back, fortunately, of a piece of work done by Historic England and Worcestershire County Council in 2015, 2016, which showed the value, and we all know the value of local, local societies and local research, but it showed the value of, um, or rather the potential of the research they've done. And that report for Historic England on local history and heritage project suggested that uh, there were 12,000 12, archaeology and heritage projects undertaken in, in Britain in the first half of the 2010s, between 2010 and 2015. That's a huge volume of research to draw on. And then, of course, there's the museum sector. And we were expanding uh, with this project our reach into the wider museum sector. So, for instance, there are there, there are over 600 independent industrial archaeology and heritage museums in England alone. Um, 
over, uh, uh, with a significant number in the northwest of England. There you go. Over 70 industrial heritage sites alone in northwest England, you can see on the left there, which are preserved and open to the public. Um, and there's research, uh, research going on at the moment about um, which which of those sites have been added to, which have been uh, which have been closed. And this is just one sector, one section of the museum world. All of these have a contribution to make to um, our understanding of the historic environment of Northwest England. But it, it, inevitably, you know, the industrial heritage of the Northwest shows through very substantially when we start to think in terms of standing buildings and also in terms of the museums available for the public in our region. And then also between 2006, 7 and 2018, 2020, the professional archaeology world has undergone quite radical change. Uh, just before the financial crash in 20, uh, 2008, there were about 6,500 uh, 6 full-time archaeologists in Britain, uh, that number dropped by a third by 2020. We got to 2020, that number had gone up above 7,000 again, um, with 83 registered organisations uh, working in the UK, over 350 archaeology units and consultants and sole traders, generating over 4,000 pieces of written work per year. As you can see, there's an awful lot in the northwest of England. And Manchester, Manchester is one of the focal points for professional archaeology in the north of England. Partly, partly because of the volume of redevelopment work, <coughs> which has gone on in the city throughout the last 15 years, despite the recession of the uh, after the financial crash, despite COVID, but also because of the extensive built environment and below ground remains for the industrial period from the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries. So outside of London, Manchester is, or Greater Manchester is, is, is probably the busiest area for professional archeology. span and, and just so you get an idea of the volume of work being produced by these archeologists, professional archaeologists, this is unpublished work. This is published work they produced. This is just the published work. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the corollary to that is the voluntary sector. And one way to assess the impact of the voluntary sector is to see where the National Heritage Lottery Fund have been uh, providing funds for heritage. And, um, you see here that actually, you know, in that sort of 20 year period between the mid 1990s and 2016, so just before the research revised research project started, we've got um, over 70 projects, maybe as many as 100, it, dealing with archaeology and heritage. That's all generating new material as well. And then the published material and great literature material. As when we propose gender in 2016, of well, we thought we knew at least 400 books and articles had been published on the northwest of England on the archaeology and built environment. By the time we got to the end of the data gathering phase um, in 2020, we realised that between 2006 and 2020, over 900 books and articles on Northwest archaeology and built environment had been published in that period. And over 4,000 grey literature items deposited with local planning archaeologists in the same period. Most of those through the planning process, but actually quite a number from local history and archaeology societies. So that's more than double the number of publications we, we estimated at the beginning of the project were out there and um, nearly treble the number of grey literature material we'd estimated as well. Um, I would I like to think we would have gone ahead with the project had we realised the volume of material involved, um, but it was quite surprising um, just to see 
how much material had been published. Oh, and uh, here we go. Here's a, here's a range of front covers here, including um, Rowan Patel's uh, wonderful volume on windmills and water mills of the Wirral up there in the top left. Um, yeah, the fantastic material here uh, from a range of writers and a range of groups covering professional, voluntary, heritage agencies, local groups. It's, 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 we, we are very fortunate in having such an active uh, heritage sector. Just to show you the volume of, <laughs> of, of work, I've just pulled out a case study here, just, just for this slide, of the industrial archaeology act, uh, activity through the um, the planning process in the region. Uh, you can see on the right um, the sp uh, um, of archaeological work, much of it industrial archaeology in the region. Inevitably urban areas predominate like Chester, Manchester, Lancaster and, and Carlisle leap out. Um, but you just think of the, the, the material in uh, the the planning uh, requirements here and the professional archaeologists and, and buildings historians doing this work, we know, for instance, that most of the 300 or so plus um, technical reports produced by the University of Salford's archaeology section, which, which I ran from 2009 to 2020, um, dealt with industrial archaeology remains in the region. And, and, and that is just one of over 30 contractors working in Greater Manchester, mind the rest of the region. It's a huge volume of data we were faced with summarising to try and get a view as to what the latest uh, thoughts were and what the latest uh, data tells us. A lot of that initial updating of where the reports were, Um, Association for Local Government Archaeologists in each of the major planning authorities in the region from Cumbria to Greater Manchester, Merseyside, Cheshire and Lancashire. Um, they gave an awful lot of their time to actually come up with those summaries. It was absolutely vital. Otherwise, you could it would have meant employing one person for six months to, to summarise that material. Um, it's far better to use local knowledge in this way. Um, whether that kind of approach, however, is sustainable in the future, well, that, 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 that's open to question. It was decided that we take the initial period chapter volumes and update them. So the only major change we, we put in into the structure was in the first research framework for archaeology, we had a single chapter covering the prehistoric period. So that's everything. In, in Northwest terms, that's everything from the end of the last ice age through to the arrival of the Romans in the first century AD. Um, for the framework, because of the increase in the volume of material, both for the earlier prehistoric periods, Mesolithic, Neolithic, uh, Bronze Age, and for, because of the increase in material for the later prehistoric, Late Bronze Age, Iron Age, for want of a better terminology, we decided we'd split that into two separate chapters. Otherwise, these chapters map pretty much what we published in 06 7. And the other thing we did here was we asked the individual lead writers for these chapters. Um, these chapters are always, always in the first one. Uh, first version of the framework, and again in the second version of the framework, they were always written as collaborative as they could, uh, where they wanted to, key researchers, whether they be professional, academic or voluntary, uh, having an input. But there was always a key editor for each chapter. Now, in some cases, we weren't able to make use of the original uh, chapter editors because sadly several of the chapter editors are no longer with us or they've retired and decided they didn't want to uh, in, uh, take on that burden um, again but for about half the chapters we were able to encourage the original chapter editors to uh, to pull that material together again because it date with what was going on 
in general, each of these chapters includes at least half a dozen authors, in some cases, eight or nine authors pulling material together. And that's what I mean about this being a, a very much a collaborative, a community effort. I thought whilst whilst I'm giving this overview of, of the, the new regional research framework for the historic environment in Northwest England, it might be might be useful just just to pull out on a very personal basis some of the archaeology and heritage buildings highlights since 2007. Uh, I'm not going to go into these in any detail, but I throw them up there uh, because each of these sites features in the relevant chapters of the uh, recent research question. This, for instance, is an aerial view of the Stainton West Mesolithic and Neolithic site at Carlisle, excavated as ahead of the Carlisle Northwest Bypass in 2011 and 2012, uh, the biggest single prehistoric excavation in Northwest England, uh, with some fantastic organic material from the Paleo channels of the River Eden, and uh, such a large excavation, which involved a total sample, environmental sample of the soils across the site, that at one stage, all the Tupperware boxes, um, sort of for a litre and two litre and four litre boxes um, in northwest England had allegedly been bought up for the, uh, for the project. This generated tens of thousands of lithic tools as well as organic material, um, a really, a really rich site, which um, is now moving towards publication a decade after the, the archaeologists came off site. Um, that was a developer funded site, a road building site. <clears throat> this is a long running community project uh, run by uh, a local group. This is, the, this is Poulton in um, southwest of Chester, where there's a main it's emerging from the lower floodplain, which is starting to change our understanding of uh, the Iron Age in Western Cheshire and on the borders with Northwest Wales, uh, a site which um, has had several publications right at the end of the uh, research period for, for this project and, and more to follow. Um, uh, and also, I, I would also highlight individual finds. We have the Portable Antiquities Scheme, which back in 2005-06 was sort of five or six years in uh, old, but still still developing. Um, uh, for this project, the Portable Antiquities Scheme had, had become a well-developed project with antiquities officers for reporting fines primarily, but not exclusively from metal detectorists across the region. Um, and there are tens of thousands of metal objects reported uh, each year, um, starting to change our understanding of the distribution of certain types of projects from uh, certain types of artifacts from the later prehistoric Roman and medieval period. I throw this up because this is one of the most controversial ones uh, reported or uh, yeah, reported to the project, but not necessarily um, not, not necessarily the outcome we wanted. This is the Crosby Garrett helmet. <clears throat> a bronze object which was not declared treasure trove and is now in private hands and highlights some of the difficulties in, in securing the future of these tens and tens of thousands of archaeological objects that come up each year through metal detecting, but also demonstrate how um, these objects can change our understanding of the uh, the context of particular periods. You know, this is this is second or third century. century AD. It's found in the um, Upper Eden Valley in Cumbria, and it's a fantastic object that, that speaks to uh, all sorts of linkages community. Um, and it's just very sad it's no longer on public display. But that's the kind of data we need to capture. And then for the medieval period, um, uh, just throw throw up here a community archaeology excavation done at Halton Castle in 2015, and then again in 2017 as part of work by, uh, by uh, uh, Norton Priory, who managed the site and heritage. 
lottery funded. Uh, and this was undertaken really to, to assess the quality of archaeology in the Outer Bailey on the back of work from the 1980s. Um, lovely community archaeology project that threw up, very surprisingly, the presence of two, possibly three skeletons within the Outer Bailey of the castle tend not to have burials in them. And then in terms of built heritage, so much to choose from um, in terms of activity since 2007. But I put this one on because this is within an arson attack in 2016, which nearly destroyed the building, but for the timely arrival of the Greater Manchester Fire Brigade. And although extensive damage was done, that damage ironically revealed the fabric of the 16th century hall, which is where most of the damage was done, the timber framed hall here, and led to a four year project of restoration. Windsor Hall is now open to the public. This important uh, medieval uh, well, 16th century timber framed hall and its medieval ancestors and its subsequent Georgian reshaping and, and we can fit this in now to the the um a tradition of large-scale hall building in timber in the 16th century um, it demonstrates some of the dangers to our historic buildings but also some of the opportunities as well that come around and then for the industrial period i'm, I'm just going to include i just included this slide which is the excavation of the complete textile mill in the center of manchester uh, this is Arkwright's Shude Hill Mill. It's the first purpose-built cotton mill in Manchester, and it was excavated ahead of the building of the co-op's new headquarters and in, in the northern quarter. First discovered by, or, or rather the remains were discovered by, the Manchester Region Industrial Archaeology Society in 0304, and an evaluation done by Channel 4's Time Team programme. And that provided a base of data which was then used when a planning application came in in 2012 to build on the site and allowed the whole of this 1780s, 1790s and 1800s mill to be excavated. And there's lots and lots of goodies in there, which I won't go into. So gathering the data was a mammoth task in itself and, and took about 18 months to pull together. Uh, the next stage was to update the uh, the, uh, the uh, resource assessment and the research agenda. And we took the view that what we would do with the project, or the, you know, the steering group, it was about 12, 15 people on the steering group for the project, we took the view that we would um, allow, uh, allow the existing text to be updated. We, we wanted to update that uh, text. So that's the approach we took. And early on, we decided that we would consolidate the text in, into one, one form. So we wouldn't end up with a project with two, two volumes. We'd end up with one volume, for instance, because the end point for much of this information was going to be an online interactive uh, website. So we um once we had the draft updated text for uh, each of our period chapters we then went out to consultation um we started the project with a with a big conference to announce this was going on and then we had a second conference and then we had um a series of workshops in 2017 2018 to think about the research questions and this is a really key part of the project um, it's where most engagement within the project came from um, we had over um, 120 people attending uh, six workshop sessions i think there were across the region from cumbria to to, to chester and merseyside and, and greater manchester in late 2017 early 2018 and um, we took the existing research questions for each uh, each period chapter and went over 
over the course of a day, whether those research questions were still relevant, whether they needed updating, whether we needed and got people to decide whether we knew questions. And it was, for me, it was one of the most interesting and exciting bits of the project. Because here you could see heritage professionals, um, academics and uh, the voluntary sector really all mingling together, arguing in some detail uh, quite often about whether a particular research question from, uh, from the 07 volume should be included. And you can see here how we did it. We, we printed out the old research. Suggesting amendments. Do we keep this? Do we chuck that? Uh, do we need something else? Um, quite an intense day spent doing that, but incredibly useful. And it's a technique we use for the original research framework, um, and it worked well for the second research framework. It did, though, produce a list of research questions that numbered more than 400, which, which might, those 400 questions are spread across these 10 topics. And those 10 topics can be found in virtually every period chapter. That was one of the key things we wanted to do, to, to have a, a consistent approach to how we were describing the historic environment and the archaeology of the region. And a lot of those headings actually go back to the original 2006-2007 uh, research framework volumes. So you can see here um, the kind of themes that would cross periods. And in many of those 400 questions, actually a lot of those questions overlap in terms of uh, period. They're, they're sort of specific to a period, but they overlap between uh, multiple uh, periods. So you can see you can see here how, how we're approaching this. Uh, lots of questions on the environment, rural, se rural settlement, urban settlement, uh, religion, ritual and ceremony, technology and production. Uh, trade, exchange and interaction. Conflict and campaigning uh, was something that was sort of slightly tweaked from the first framework volume. Uh, and then we've got transport and infrastructure and leisure and recreation. Um, the, underneath all of those, there are plenty of other uh, sort of detailed questions. And this is, this is what, at least in the printed volume, I'll show you what it looks like on the, on the interactive website in a moment. This is what the printed volume questions look like. This is uh, uh, two extracts. On the left is the earlier and later prehistoric period questions, starting um, with the general the general questions. There's four questions there on the left. So there's a question in, in, in the left-hand column, and then a sort of suggestion as to what this means in the right-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, um, that's early medieval um, some of the early medieval questions. Um, the numbering is specific to each period. Um, and again, the co there's colour coding in terms of topics. So every every set of general questions is sort of headlined by that sort of purpley information bar. Uh, all the um, technology and production questions are headlined in, in green. All the trade and exchange ones in pink, and all the warfare and military activity and defence ones in orange, just to give some kind of consistency, at least in the printed version. Uh, things are a lot easier online. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this is per you know, the Northwest Re Research Framework um, project is part of a wider set of projects which in England are, are sponsored by Historic England that deal with. Um, landscapes, regions, uh, specific periods. But at least in, uh, Britain, uh, yeah, across Britain, this is now part of a wider project that includes the uh, heritage statutory, statutory heritage authorities in Wales and Scotland. And there is now a single um, website where all uh, many of these uh, frameworks from Scotland, England and Wales uh, are now accessible. Uh, this is the Research Frameworks Network. This emerged, this has emerged in the last two or three years. Uh, researchframeworks.org is, is what you want. And if you go into there, you, you know, there's a general in, introduction page that tells you what 
uh, research frameworks are about, gives you the history going back to 1996, English heritage, and also then including uh, you know, the historic environment, Scotland and Cadu uh, as well. And then there's this interactive map where you can click on by region and it will pull up all the research frameworks on this website that are relevant to that region. And that might be um, city frameworks, it might be regional frameworks, it could be national frameworks that have a relevance for that particular region. This is what the introductory page to the Northwest Regional Research Framework looks like. Um, so there's, there's a massive image data bank to go with this. And at the top, you can see the headings, which allow you to drill down into the data available on the, on the website. So there's a version, there's an online version of all the period chapter text um, under resource assessments. And then resource, resource research agenda is where you'll find those 400 research questions. And there's also the first research framework as well as a PDF uh, from 0607 for you to uh, compare with and it says there how to contribute and how how to use the research framework site this is an interactive website the idea is that as i said at the beginning the framework will not be static but instead of having to wait a decade for a funding and a team to come together and and um, update it in a, in a sort of more traditional academic style, what we're looking at here is the ability to add new questions or add data to those questions on this website in real time. Now, that does mean that there has to be a management team and some uh, gatekeeping as to uh, providing access to edit questions and we have to always be careful that people are not doing it in a malicious way. I'm sure they, I'm sure they wouldn't, but we, we just have to uh, wary of that but when you go into the website and look at individual questions this is what this is the page that comes up this is the beginning of the industrial and 20th century period section and you can see it, it, you know, the the questions are numbered there and you link on to more information on this question and you can drill down into what do we mean by what is what evidence is there for the impact of industrialization on health diet and natural resources and that you can see on the right hand side, it, it, it suggests um, what that might mean. And then there is a way of adding data to show how that question has been explored. And also there's also there's the potential to uh, mark that question as either complete or in need of being updated. And it's envisaged that this website will be live for years and therefore when we come to having a summary update, we should, in theory, be able to um, take material off the website in order to provide an updated text for a particular period or indeed a particular research question. And the idea is that this may well, this should speed up the process for keeping the this research relevant and up to date. So where does that leave us? Uh, after all that effort, this huge communal effort, which has involved more than 200 people over four years across the region, contributing to uh, to the revised regional research framework for the historic environment in our region, um, you know, looking at the 900 plus publications, the 4000 plus grey literature material, all those heritage lottery projects, all those university undergraduate and postgraduate theses. Um, well, I think what we've got here is an up-to-date audit of the knowledge and research that's been generated for that, you know, as it now is, a 14-year period, um, 2006 to 2020. We've had genuine community and professional and academic involvement, and we have this interactive website which uh, is going to keep that involvement uh, going and will allow real-time updating and this material in this framework is is for use by heritage planners conservation officers planning archaeologists and professionals 
And the research questions can form the basis of university, period, and local society projects. It's there to be used. It's in this sense, it's the Northwest's regional research framework. For anybody working on archaeology in the built environment in the Northwest, this is our, our collective view of what's important, what we know, um, and what we might want to research. Um, and because it's on this interactive website, it should evolve and change as our collective view as a group changes as well. Has it, will it also raise the profile for heritage? Has it raised the profile for heritage? Well, I'll leave others to decide on that, but it's certainly one way of doing that. And it does provide um, a, a sort of entry point for understanding many, many of the archaeology and built heritage topics that we deal with in the northwest of England. And I don't just mean if you're a, a, a building firm wanting to, to, to build a new housing estate and you want to employ some archaeologists and you, you don't know what kind of archaeology you might have, but I mean in the sort of widest sense in terms of opening up the past to as many people as possible by giving a freely available online this huge amount of data about what we already know and what we might want to know in the future. And the conclusion for the moment, or, or conclusion is conclusion is perhaps the wrong word, but the uh, we have a point in time publication uh, to go with the um, interactive website. So this is this is if you like the more traditional element of the project. This is the printed version of the resource assessment and research framework in a single volume, not two, in a single volume. We felt it was, as, as, as a project team back in 2016, 17, we felt it was very important to have this as a, as a statement, even though we knew it would become out of date. But then again, we could refer people to the interactive website. But these kind of point in time documents, although highly technical, and in this case, quite chunky, it weighs 1.3 kilograms, 300 pages long, uh, about 200 illustrations in it. Um, they form part of that wider interaction between what we as people interested in archaeology and the historic environment and the wider world um, are doing and might want to know about our uh, region. Therefore, I think it's important to have this as a printed document. We, we live in a hybrid world where we do things both online, digitally and face to face. And, in, and sort of in hard copy. And, and that was the whole point about having this particular document. It's been published by CBA Northwest um, with the support of the University of Salford, but CBA Northwest are the ones who have it and, and, and will distribute it. Um, there's, um, uh, the copies are available for CBA Northwest and CBA North members and for the wider public and of course, contributors to the research framework as well it was ready to go at the in um, november 2020 but obviously covid intervened and so um, we concentrated on getting the interactive website up and running first and then finally uh this year we've we've now published the printed document which is actually slightly different not in terms of research questions but, but in terms of uh, the text is slightly different and some of the illustrations are slightly different to, to the uh, PDF version on the website. Uh, horses for courses, I suppose. So there we are. That's, that's um, a brief overview of a, of a long running research project that has been trying to update the, our research knowledge and framework to capture the research done in the region for archaeology and the built environment. Uh, between 07 and 2020. As I said at the beginning, it's a communal effort. Um, the steering group and the research panels and then the workshops involved more than 200 people. And although my name and um, Norman Redhead, who was the county archaeologist at the time for Greater Manchester and, and, and co-lead on the project, are on the front of that volume, it is very much an expression of the heritage and archaeology community of the northwest of England and what we see as being important in the early 2020s for understanding the historic environment of northwest England.
Thank you very much. I'm just going to stop sharing at that point. And thank you very much, Mike. I'm always at this stage looking for the option that says unmute all.